I think it's a it's a sad misconception that for someone to succeed in business, they have to be exploitative. It's sad that you know consumers have to be skeptical, and it's sad that entrepreneurs are what's the word rapacious. They could excuse behavior by saying, "Well, if we want to succeed, we gotta fuck these people over and manipulate them." It's probably harder to succeed in business with a symbiotic relationship with your customers. But it's a lot easier if you are in an advertising-based business where you have three total parties and your customers are advertisers and your users are just eyeballs. One thing that Elopath is trying to do that's different than typical software companies, we're just not building these advertising-based services. We're making stuff that we charge for. And we're not just giving something away for free in the hopes that we'll get acquired by probably an advertising company. And so I think that we can legitimately improve people's lives and feel good about everything we're doing and make a lot of money and go on a lot of cool talk shows. Hi, I'm Justin Hall and welcome to the Justin Hall Show where we exchange provocative ideas. In 21st century San Francisco, many people have started software companies hoping to sell them for lots of money. If they achieve these dreams, what happens next? Recently, I sat down with Jake Lodwick. Jake started his career as a computer programmer. When he was 23, he developed a web video site called Vimeo. Vimeo was sold for millions of dollars when Jake was only 25 years old. And just one year later, Jake was fired from the purchasing company. Now in his early 30s, Jake has launched a new venture, Elipath, a software studio making websites and mobile apps. So what do you, what's the one sentence description of Elipath? The mission is fill the world with great software. We started the company with no, not many rules. And one of the explicit allowances was anyone can just start a new project at any time. Well, after a year, we had six employees and six projects. And none of the projects were really going anywhere. So we made a rule. And that was if you want anything, you want to work on a project after the first week, you have to get someone else to work on it with you. And you both make that project your top priority. You can only have one top priority at a time. So this caused people to stop working on certain projects and to focus a little bit. And that was when Keezy came together. And that was when Exposure came together. And those are two things that are very good pieces of software and they have their own little teams inside of the larger company. People have this thing in their head where they want someone to be making the decision and to be the boss and to be like the ultimate authority. And I think there's just some weakness to that. There is the role for that boss, but I think a company where people can think for themselves and have the confidence to make decisions and deal with the consequences if they're wrong is gonna be a much stronger, more durable company. Somehow Jake has already planned his departure from this new company. Yeah, it's uh, March 3rd, 2022 is my last day at Allopath, and I'm trying to set it all up in the meantime so that it doesn't require me. And it's a cultural programming exercise of creating a corporate culture that's sustainable. I don't want to build a company and flip it a year to three years later. I want to build something enduring. And so I was at a point where, you know, I had sold a company I had more money than I needed. This is a crazy thing. People don't talk about this a lot, they should. If you're working your whole life and then you create a company and sell it, you might have enough money that you don't need to work anymore. That's a really challenging to, position to be in. It's not challenging financially, but it's challenging psychologically because you don't necessarily know what you should be doing with your time anymore. And so, I'm not crying about that, but you have to kind of piece together a new story of what you're gonna do every day. Most people, they know they have to go to work because they need to make money. So it was for me for a while, and then at some point I didn't have to do that anymore. And then I got fired, so I didn't even have the job anymore. You know, I had to decide what I was gonna do with my time, and that was, oh, I might as well 
build an idealistic company. How long is that going to take? Well, the way I want to do it is going to take 10 years. Could you speak for a moment about your own self-presentation and the current phase you're in? Yeah, well, I'm doing something that's really, um, you know, I thought I'd never do, which is I put product in my hair because um, I just really like having a mohawk. And it's not really mohawk if, you, if it's just straight down. Oh, and I wear all black because it's just much easier that way. So that's my, I like black. Everything else is just kind of arbitrary. It's like if I had a, a red and blue shirt, I'll like get stuck trying to pick which one I'm wearing. So I just wear black, <laughs> just wear black every day. Man, I'm nuts. Oh my God, I'm so nuts. I just see it when I do an interview. Thanks, you asked a lot of good questions. What do you, what, what do you mean? You just, you hear yourself talk and you think, I don't sound like the other people in media or when I hear my own ideas discussed, they don't sound tenable or Man, what? I mean, I know it makes sense for myself, but then I'm like, I'm just, I'm just weird. Isn't everybody weird and you just have been able to amplify and grow free in your weirdness? I think people start out maybe with the weird potential. I don't know. I, I know myself more intimately than I know other people. The weirdness is just, I think, mostly a result of being like out of sync with other people. It's not like, I want to be weird so people will be afraid of me or pay attention to me. It's like, I'm just not tuned in. I want to be alone all the time. And so in my, in my solitude, I end up just developing in a way that is not based on so many other things. <laughs> so, and that's fascinating because here's this guy who's like kind of a loner, kind of weird, and he's gonna build a harmonious social structure for group productivity. <laughs> yeah, I think it's easier to do if you're, if you're thinking your own thoughts clearly. I mean, you know, it's a mix of my own imagination and then the book I love, Built to Last, this wonderful business book. They, there's a lot of business books that are like folk wisdom of like, here's, at my company, we always poured hot maple syrup on our feet every month and we made a billion dollars. So be sure to pour maple syrup on yourself. But um, this one built to last is actually scientific. And so they just studied all these businesses and looked at what they had in common and certain things they have in common. And that was the book that made me realize that a company was a cultural entity that it's held together, it has the, the, you know, the means, the ideas in people's heads are like the DNA in the cells of a body. And you can design the DNA of your company from very early on and make it into something that works in a deliberate, purposeful, meaningful way. It, a lot of companies start out because someone has a discovery, they want to commercialize it, or they're like, oh, there's an opportunity in this market. But they're not usually thinking about the values, the mission, the vision, um, the policy. Policy just evolves in the most haphazard way and companies are like, if people are fighting against each other because there's there are no principles constraining the culture and making it into something with integrity. A company designed to have integrity could be a beautiful thing. That's what I'm pursuing. Jake has shared a lot about himself with the web before. I asked him to describe his relationship to sharing on the web today. I was making personal websites since high school, since, you know, the mid-90s. And you could put stuff on there and not a lot of people would see it. So you could be really weird, you could say whatever you wanted, and the only people who would really see it were like other weirdos. And then there was this crossover time that was really confusing to me. The media was starting to move online. And so stuff I would do that normally would be seen by just a couple weirdos was starting to get seen by like anyone working in an office. There was stuff I would share that was then, you know, basically used against me, not with the explicit goal of hurting me, but with the goal of getting page views by talking about somebody who was saying something, you know, um, politically incorrect or was, um, you know, arguing with someone or was oversharing. So the, the culture of putting yourself out there had very different effects as more people came online. I think there's less nudity at, at parties now because it's 
fucking Orwellian, like people, <laughs> it's not Orwellian, people with their cameras, and you, any behavior can be taken out of context. We're all like watching and judging each other. I'm not, I'm not on any fucking judgy social networks. I'm on Facebook, not on Instagram, I'm not on Tumblr anymore. I do use Twitter, but it's not like, oh my God, look what Jessica was drinking. Like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, why do people even do that? I don't know. I'm too autistic and introverted to understand gossiping about people's genitals. You did social networking when it was challenging. Yeah, when it was manual. Mm -hmm. And now it's too popular. Too easy. Yeah, it's not that it's easy. It's just that the ease has changed it into something that I don't think is, is nourishing. It's not designed to be healthy. Social networks are not designed to make your life better. They're designed to engage you so that their customers or advertisers can buy up your attention. And so if something isn't optimized to make your life better, it's probably not going to make your life better. These things are designed to exploit your weaknesses and take advantage of psychological facts about humans. So I avoid it because it's, it's just this dystopian... Oh my god, I hate it. I hate it so much. I mean, if you think about it, we all carry around research portals in our pocket. Everybody, Every day people are doing research, but they're doing research on what TV shows their friends are yeah. watching. We could do all sorts of amazing stuff. Find out when Poland was founded. I mean, you can find out anything. Find out the atomic weight of cesium. What is that? It's five decimal places. But then you can find out like equally trivial stuff about people. And it's just usually not interesting to me. So that's why I um, play The Last of Us on Sony PlayStation 3. The incredible post-apocalyptic zombie game. Zombie game trivializes it. It's a relationship game. It's about the relationship of a man and a girl in this awful environment. It's got shooting. It's got stealth. <laughs> fungus, cordyceps virus, where, which is a real thing, but not for humans. So let me ask you, Jake, do you think there's something funny about you saying, I avoid social networks because there's people on them, but I like this game Last of Us and it's a relationship game? Yeah, but where there's like no people left because of zombies. I mean, that's... <laughs> so thanks to Jake Lodwick and thank you for watching. I make the Justin Hall Show. People like you support the Justin Hall Show on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash Justin.